Okay, party people at the Chaos West stage, I welcome you to an amazing talk held by an amazing person. That's him, Michael. Um, this is a self-organized session, so all the talks that are held here, they really come from you guys. And um, we made up the plan, I think, on day zero or day one. Michael, when did you have the idea to hold this talk? Two days ago. Two days ago, okay. So this is the strength of this stage, it's uh, very spontaneous and um, it's from, from us, for us. So uh, I'm happy to, uh, to host this together with my team and I'm happy to hear some more about uh, magic internet money from Michael. Give him an applause, please. Thank you. So hi everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Michael, I'm a security researcher and a cryptocurrency enthusiast. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, money, right? But not this kind of money. This is a uh, boring old money. I'm here to talk about money of the future. So uh, cryptocurrencies, digital money, and Bitcoin, right? I know most of you are already familiar with Bitcoin. So what is Bitcoin? It's many things, right? It's the first cryptocurrency. It's a way to achieve trust a way to achieve consensus without trusting. Uh, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. It's a ledger which can't be modified. It's uh, money you pay when your computer gets encrypted with ransomware. It's probably the greatest invention since the internet and the greatest bubble in history at the same time. And it's dead, right? 200 times now it's been declared dead. So it all started in uh, nine years ago when uh, this white paper was published by an uh, anonymous uh, actor, a group or person calling himself Satoshi Nakamoto. And it talked about this crazy idea of creating a new form of money where um, there is no central bank, it's digital, and it's protected by cryptography and math. And uh, it sounded crazy, and still sounds a bit crazy, it took uh, some existing ideas and created a whole new form of uh, money, technology, and more. But when you talk to people about Bitcoin, they say, yeah, 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 whatever, consensus, uh, blockchain, but what about the price, right? So um, this chart is very outdated. It's uh, the Bitcoin price chart uh, up until a year ago. So here you can see the famous uh, Bitcoin bubble of 2013-2014 where uh, the price went from uh, less than $100 to more than $1,000 in a matter of days or weeks. But what you may not be aware of is this little bubble here uh, which uh, was the first Bitcoin bubble where the price went from $0.30 cents to $30 also in a matter of weeks and then came, crash came crashing down. Now, uh, this thing looks a lot like a roller coaster, right? So it's going up, it's coming down, it's going up again. So let's see what's, what did we miss this year. So this is, this is the current Bitcoin chart. And uh, where, is the, where are those bubbles, right? Well, here they are. The first bubble is invisible and the second bubble looks pretty much like the first bubble uh, a year ago and uh, while the Bitcoin is uh, a roller coaster it seems like the train has uh, left the rails and uh, launched into space but this is probably just another bubble which will be uh, fixed soon uh, and Bitcoin is not alone right so uh, Bitcoin is one cryptocurrency and it only went up by 20 times in value while other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, uh, Ripple and a uh, whole lot of others, shit coins even down where you can see them, went 100, in times of, 100 times in value. So we are witnessing some kind of bubble where people are going crazy and uh, just uh, buying this stuff because they think the price is going to go up. Uh, and uh, another example of how crazy things have become 
Let's say you want to buy a cat, right? So you want to buy a very expensive cat. You're doing your research and you found that um, this cat, uh, say Persian cat, Persian cat, it costs three thousand dollars. And you, you say to yourself, well, it's a lot of money, but at least I get a real cat, a quality cat. Now you can see the face of that cat, and he's shocked because that cat has discovered that a crypto kitty which is nothing more than a virtual cat, can cost $120,000, and you can't do anything with it except breed it and sell it. Reminder, this is the crypto kitty and this is the real kitty, just if, you, if you're confused. So, uh, yeah, interesting, right? Well, it seems this whole thing is exploding, and why shouldn't we be part of it? Let's invent our own cryptocurrency. Let's be part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Chaos Coin, nice. Uh, I have a better name. So, um, what are our goals with this cryptocurrency? Well, most important, we should have a cool name and a logo, so everybody will think it's cool. But more serious things, it should be decentralized, like all cryptocurrencies, or most cryptocurrencies. Uh, because there is no bank. We, we are the bank. Uh, transactions cannot be reversed. And imp most important, you can't fake. Not currency and not transactions. So, um, how should we name it? Uh, well, you know, I want a name that people understand. When, when they see the name, they understand what this thing is. And for many people, cryptocurrencies are magic money which you can use on the internet right so why not call it magic internet money coin or meme coin right and this is the logo i designed it myself thank you thank you <laughs> thank you uh okay so uh meme coin uh, is a protocol like bitcoin and we should write this protocol now together but let's start with something simple. Forget everything you know about Bitcoin. We want to invent everything from the ground up, right? OK, so we will use a log file. Let's call it a ledger. Uh, I'm not stealing from Bitcoin, no. <laughs> it's my invention. Uh, I want to use a, a file that all the participants maintain, right? And it contains all the accounts and all the transactions. And uh, when someone wants to transfer money, he just tells everyone, hey, I want to transfer money, this, this amount of meme coin to this account. And the founders of this meme coin get 100 meme coin each, which is the money which uh, the economy starts with. So meet our founders. This is Pikachu. And we're going to look at everything from the point of view of Pikachu. And uh, Pikachu has friends, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they decided to create a network between them. And this is the ledger. This is from the point of view of Pikachu. We can see that the ledger contains only four transactions, which are basically the from air to Alice. 100 meme coin from air to Bob 100 meme coin and so on when I say from air it means there is no sender there is only a receiver and the network is live we are live the main net is launched let's see how it goes <laughs> so um, Pikachu is just sitting there listening for transactions and he gets a transaction that Bob is transferring uh, 20 meme coin to Charlie and he says great it looks okay I'll just add it to the ledger right then Pikachu agreed to buy a hammer from Bob. And for that hammer, he agreed to pay 100 meme coin. So what Pikachu did is he added the transaction to his ledger and broadcast it to everyone. Everything's, everything is looking great, right? So meme coin is working. We're done. Well, a few minutes later, Pikachu sees this transaction, which supposedly he transferred all his remaining money to Alice. And he's angry because he never did that. Um, so apparently, Alice 
is malicious and she just wrote this transaction and nobody can dispute it. So, fake transactions, issue number one. How can we uh, prevent others from faking transactions? How can we verify that the sender of the transaction is really the sender? So, um, there is a solution for that. It's not related to Bitcoin. Digital identities uh, or digital signatures powered by public key cryptography. So, uh, I'll explain. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with public cryptography, I have a really quick explanation, high level explanation, how it works. So, uh, Pikachu, uh, so here we have Pikachu, and he has two keys, a private and a public. Now, these keys have a special relationship. Uh, what one key crypts, the only the other can decrypt. Okay? So, uh, say Pikachu has a message he wants to broadcast. He encrypts it with his private key. He gets something called a signature. It's a signature because you can verify that if you use Pikachu's public key, which is a public knowledge, you get the message back. So how would it work? We have Pikachu and Bob. Pikachu has pub private and public keys. He wants to transfer money to Bob, so he has this message. He uses the private key, creates a signature. He then appends the public key and sends the, the thing to Bob. Now Bob can verify that it came from Pikachu or actually Pikachu's public key by taking the signature, using the attached public key, getting the same message as the original message. We know it works. However, if Pikachu does that and all he gets is something else, he knows, uh, sorry, Bob. If Bob does that and Dolly gets something else, then uh, we know uh, the signature is invalid. But we have another problem. How, how do we know those keys belong to Pikachu in the first place? Like, okay, so I got a message and it has a valid signature, but how do I know those keys belong to Pikachu? So, um, there's a simple solution to that. So. Who the hell is Pikachu anyway? Pikachu is someone in real life. But we don't really care about Pikachu in real life. We only care that it's Pikachu's account. It's someone's account. So if we just change the uh, account to be a public key, then now if Alice wants to fake a transaction and send money on uh, Pikachu's behalf, she needs Pikachu's private key because it says that the money is coming from Pikachu's public key. And... Um, as a bonus, we, we got a pseudonymity. Since there are no more accounts, um, we don't know exactly who is behind the public key. And it's good. I mean, we don't need to know. Um, but it can lead to other problems, so-called problems. So how does it look now? You can see now the ledger is, uh, contains names, but those names actually are just uh, for readability, for you and for me. What it really contains is the thing in brackets, which are the public keys, right? So now instead of Alice getting 100 meme coin, it's Alice's public key getting 100 meme coin. So uh, how does it work now? It's the same thing. We have the first uh, transaction. It's great. The second transaction is great. And we have this transaction, which is not valid anymore. And everybody can know it's not valid because um, Pikachu never did this transaction, it was Alice, and Alice doesn't have Pikachu's private key, so this thing uh, can easily be uh, verified to be fa fake and removed from the ledger. So Pikachu does that and so does everyone else. Now, um, what you may not know about Pikachu is that he is uh, doing well in life, and he has a Ferrari, and he decided to sell his Ferrari to Alice. So uh, he doesn't care that Alice is uh, malicious. He says, I trust the system. As long as I see a transaction from Alice that I'm getting 100 meme coins and it's signed by Alice, then the money is mine and I don't care. So I can give her my Ferrari. However, what Pikachu doesn't know is that 
Bob has made a deal with Alice as well to sell his toolbox for all of Alice's money, which is supposed to be zero, but, but Bob doesn't know that. So he waits for a transaction from Alice uh, of uh, her transferring to him 100 meme coin, and he receives it and he tells, okay, great, I can give my toolbox to Alice. Now, neither of Neither Pikachu nor Bob know that Alice actually spent double her money. Uh, but what will happen when Charlie, who is oblivious to all of this, had simultaneously receives two transactions claiming Alice has transferred all her money both to Bob and Pikachu. So what does Charlie do? He gets angry, and everybody gets angry, except Alice, who is driven to Mexico with uh, Pikachu's Ferrari and is living a good life now. Thank you, Alice. So this is called the double spending problem, which is the main thing that Bitcoin uh, actually solved and enabled what we call digital currencies now. So. Um, What's the double, double spending problem? Exactly what we witnessed. Alice can spend her money twice. How do we... Now, it wouldn't happen if we had a way of ordering transactions. So uh, when the second transaction would come, we would know that there is no more money to spend. But how, how can we achieve consensus um, in this setting? So this is actually a complex problem. So we're not going to solve it in this slide. Instead, we're going to have some ideas. So uh, first, we don't add transactions to the ledger immediately, since once they are in, inside the ledger, they already happened. Now, uh, we will group transactions into pages, and we will wait. We will group them into pages, and each participant will group transactions into a page. And then we will have some kind of a vote, with which we will say, this is the page. This is the next page that should be added to the ledger. So how does it look now? We have uh, the ledger, which is the page number one, and we have the transaction pool, which we, where we are adding all our transactions. So we have the first transaction. It does not enter the ledger immediately, so meaning it didn't happen yet. It just wants to happen. We have the second one, and we have the third one where um, Alice transferred all our money to Pikachu, and at this point, Pikachu didn't give Alice her, uh, his Ferrari yet. And it's a good thing he didn't do that because uh, now he sees that Alice is trying to spend more than she can. So, um, Pikachu crafts a candidate page. It's not a page in the ledger, it's just the page he wants to add. And um, he starts adding transactions. So, he puts the, f the first, the second, and the third. Now, he won't put the fourth because that transaction doesn't make sense in this context. It's, too, it's more money than uh, Alice has. Great. Now what? How do we vote? How do you vote in an anonymous digital world? So uh, while it's an anonymous world, uh, we trust that the majority of the peers are honest. We don't trust any specific peer, but we, do, but we do trust that the majority of the network participants will not try to game the system. So uh, what's important for this voting system? Uh, voting should, should cost something, because otherwise someone who is dishonest will just vote a million times. And voting should be fair, meaning people who are legitimate, who are honest, will get their fair chance in saying what should happen. Now, uh, as I said, it's an anonymous digital world. So digital identities have no cost. When, when, when we go to vote, we, uh, the cost is our identity. We can only vo vote once. Each person can only vote once. When we go to vote, uh, I don't know, elections or whatever, in real life. But in the digital world, the digital identity means nothing because I can create millions of identities and vote millions of times. 
But what do all the participants have in common that has a cost? Well, it's computing power. You can't fake computing power. It costs hardware, it costs electricity, it costs time. All right? Now, what's fair? A competition is fair, right? So, when I say fair, what do I mean? It means that someone, if someone has the majority of com computing power, it's not fair if he always gets to a say, if he always says what should happen. It should be proportionate to the amount of computing power I have. So we need an element of randomness that depends on the amount of power I have. So, we need more crypto. Okay. Um, we need something. We need to put our computing power to work, right? How can computing power vote? I mean, it doesn't make sense when you think about it, because when you think of voting, you, you think that you're going to a booth and putting a note. But voting is actually saying, I want this. This is the right thing. So um, if we have some kind of puzzle that we can use our computing power to solve, and the puzzle can't be faked, then when our computing power is actually trying to solve this puzzle, it's actually voting. It's voting on the solution. We will see in a second what it means. So we, the puzzle should be easy to verify, but very hard to solve. Um, so um, there is this thing called hash functions, which answer this criteria. If you want to know what the ha what's the hash value for I like bananas, you just calculate the hash value of I like bananas. And the difficulty of that is one hash calculation. Great. Now, if I give you a hash value and tell you what's the input that creates this hash value, this is an extremely difficult problem. And this is actually why it's used in cryptography. We build, we actually, um, we want it to be hard. That's the main feature of hash functions. Hash functions are random, and you can't predict what, which input creates which output. So this is not good, but what if we, instead of saying we want the whole input, what, what if we say we want a partial match, right? We only care that our input results in the M bytes being equal to this requirement. So what's the difficulty of that? That's according to the birthday problem, two in the power of M divided by two. So uh, why is it important? Because M is a variable and we can control it. If we want to make it very hard, we can just increase M. If we want to make it very easy, we can just decrease M. Amazing. So let's play a guessing game. So how can Pikachu say, this is the page I want, guys? So we can just try to play this game. What X should I add to this page that will result in some kind of requirement? So this requirement, in this case, is 20 zero bits. So M is 20. So Pikachu calculates uh, the hash value of the page without adding anything, and he sees it doesn't fill the requirement. So how hard is it finding this X? Well. It should take Pikachu, on average, 1,024 guesses. So let's get to work. By the way, it doesn't matter what value Pikachu starts with, because hash functions are random, so he can try one. It's the same as trying 99. He doesn't know what will come out. So he decides to, to try one. It doesn't work. Try two. Nope. Three. Nope so on. Until he tries this number, 1,045, and suddenly it works. So Pikachu actually did 1,045 calculations, more, a bit more than the average, to get to this value. So his computing power actually cast 1,045 votes, if you want an analogy. And once uh, once he adds this value, this is not a candidate page anymore. This is the page two of the ledger because it answers uh, the criteria. And it's very easy to verify, right? 
So this is called proof of work. Work is when you spend computing power, time, to solve a difficult puzzle. The difficulty of that work can be changed by modifying the requirements. Um, <coughs> changing the ledger from now on requires proof of work. So if you want to modify the ledger, if you want to modify, uh, if you want to claim that something happened, you have to work for it. And the winner of the competition gets to hedge, add his page to the ledger. So Pikachu won. So what he does is, first of all, he looks at the remaining transactions in the pool. And he says, well, this remaining transaction doesn't make any sense anymore because this will never be valid. Alice spent all her money already. So he removes it. And then he broadcasts this page to everyone else so they can add it to the ledger. Now, Charlie didn't participate in the game. He didn't understand why the hell he needs to spend computing power on this thing. But he's an honest guy, so yeah, he got this page. He verified that the hash is uh, valid. It, match it matches the requirement of the game. And then he cleans up his transaction pool. He removes the transactions that are already in the page. And then, like Pikachu, he removes this transaction because it doesn't make any sense anymore. So the next thing he does is broadcast it to everyone else. And Bob, well, Bob was working on his, on, on his own page. Now, before he could finish solving the puzzle, he received uh, the page from Charlie. So Bob uh, verifies this page. And he says it's a valid page. But Bob gets angry because although he, uh, he respects the, the rules of the game, he says, it's not fair. I wasted computing time. I wasted power. I wasted electricity. And all I got was nothing. Although he didn't lose his toolbox because he didn't sell it yet, this transaction did not occur yet, he still feels like he wasted his time. Which brings us to the next problem. Nobody works for free, right? So it doesn't make any sense that the whole system is uh, working to maintain this ledger, but getting nothing of it except that it's working. So uh, there is no incentive to do work. We need some kind of incentive for those who want to work. We need to reward them somehow. So how do we reward them? Well, we can uh, demand that participants pay some kind of a fee when they want to use the network. And this is also a good idea because this um, prevents spam attacks. So if someone wants to spam the network now, he has to pay some kind of fee. And, uh, but this is not enough. We, we actually, I'll take you back, we have only, in the whole economy, we have only 400 meme coins which we started with. So we need some kind of way to create new meme coins. So why not give the the guy who solved the puzzle, 50 meme coins. It creates this gold rush mentality. And we have a fair way to introduce new money to the economy now. So this is actually what we call mining. Miners are nodes that secure the network by playing this game. And in return, they get a reward. Now, mining is what introduces new money. And miners are the ones who dictate the consensus. They dictate what happens. Or actually, what happened. Because they write the history. And mining is a zero-sum game. So um, if I buy a supercomputer now, I can't just solve this easy puzzle over and over again and super inflate the whole economy, right? I want it to be difficult. So uh, we want to keep the issuance of new money at a stable rate. So we need to increase the difficulty accordingly to keep every x minutes, let's say 10. Um, so only every 10 minutes, new money is created. And only every 10 minutes, a new page is added 
to the ledger. Now, the more of, of, obviously, the more computing power is competing to uh, do this thing, then the harder it is to attack the network. So Pikachu, uh, f uh, fair and square, he solved the problem, and uh, he gets a reward. So the reward is, first of all, the 50 uh, meme coins, which uh, he gets for solving the puzzle. And then you can see that now the transactions are missing one meme coin each from the uh, receiving side. These are the fees, actually. This went to uh, Pikachu. So you can see, in total, he received 53 meme coin. This is called the Coinbase transaction. And this is the first transaction in each page. This is the only transaction where you have no sender. And everybody closes their eyes and pretend it's OK, because it's OK to create money out of thin air as long as it was done in this way. Now, uh, we were very successful with this. So Pikachu told all of his, all of his friends about MemeCoin. And uh, we are expanding, guys. We have a new participant. Well, apparently, this participant is Jigglypuff. And uh, the first thing Jigglypuff is doing, he wants to seek with the rest of the network. So he wants to get the most up-to-date ledger. Now, he knows this first page. He doesn't need to get it from anyone, because actually, this first page is um, hard-coded into the protocol. If, if you remember, I told you that the founders get 100 meme coin each. So Jigglypuff knows the first page. Now, the, something strange happened when Jigglypuff synced with the network, and he received simultaneously two pages claiming both to be page two. Now, he, he, he says to himself, well, OK, one of those pages is probably fake. So I'll just verify and, and see which one is true. So he just calculates the hash of the first page. That's correct. It, it matches the game's requirement. Calculates the hash of, hash of the second page. <coughs> it also matches the requirements. So he is confused. How come it happened? Well, what, what actually happened is that after Pikachu solved the puzzle, Alice kept working on the puzzle on her free time and also managed to craft a page that contains, doesn't contain her transaction. Basically, she still has the money for Pikachu's Ferrari. And um, she kept it until somebody new is join, will join the network. And once somebody new joined the network, she sent it immediately. So the new guy has no way of knowing which one of those pages is the real page. So uh, what's now? There's those, those two pages, and the third page arrives. Jigglypuff is confused. How can I, how can I construct a ledger? I don't know which one of those pages is the second page? We're missing something. In this setting, somebody can craft alternative pages on their own free time, and then actually dupe new participants into thinking, into breaking consensus, basically. Now, the solution is simple, because all of this wouldn't happen if the pages were linked. So let's just link the pages, meaning every new page that is created contains the hash of the previous page. That way, if I want to replace or modify some kind of page, I have to replace and modify all the following pages because they're linked. And it's protected by proof of work. And the last bit of information, which is probably the most important bit of information, which makes this whole thing work, is that as long uh, what we what we trust is the longest chain. The longest chain is the real ledger. While that may change uh, throughout um, the time of uh, of the um, chain. Uh, sorry, <laughs> forgot the name. I forgot the word. Um, let's just see how it works. It's better. Um, <clears throat> 
So now we can see that we have a new field in the page which points to uh, the previous page, right? So we have a previous hash field. Now both of these pages are valid. They point to the first page. But when a third page arrives, when page number three arrives, it points to a certain page. It points to Pikachu's page because it was the first page and everybody knew, everybody existing in the network already knew. So we can see in the previous hash field that it matches Pikachu's page number two. So Jigglypuff just links it. And notice this is the longest chain. So this chain is true. This is the true history. This is either a temporary fork or an attack attempt. So this can happen by a malicious actor or it can happen simply when two miners solve the puzzle at the same time and then the network can't agree for a second or for a few minutes on what is the real version of history. Great. Now, I want you to close your eyes <laughs> and while I replace every uh, occurrence of the word page with the word block and oh my god, we just invented the blockchain. So this thing is actually the blockchain. We didn't mean to invent it, but we did. So this is the famous blockchain that you keep hearing about, for those who are un unfamiliar. So a few words about blockchain. Uh, blockchains are coded with a genesis block, meaning you have to know what's the first block. It's part of the pot protocol. Um, now, when I said about when I talked about voting back then, it makes a whole lot of sense now. What miners do is not only vote on the current page; they actually vote on which history they believe in. When they create a new page, they link it to a previous page. Now, what they essentially are saying with their computing power is, this chain is the chain I believe in. This is the this is the real chain. So I'm going to put my computing power to work in order to extend that chain. So miners vote on history, basically. And my majority of mining power dictate history. And they can also modify history if they desire. But majority of nodes, majority of participants, are the ones who enforce the protocol. So miners can't just decide to give themselves 1,000 meme coins out of thin air in the Coinbase uh, transaction because nobody will accept that block or page. Now, every new block that gets added adds a new confirmation to the previous blocks. So, a one confirmation, meaning we are in the forefront of the chain, we are the highest block in the chain, the farthest, is risky because it's part of a fork, it can be part of a fork. Six confirmations, depending on what's the uh, time of the creation of new blocks, let's say it's 10 minutes, is considered very secure. And 100 confirmations is basically considered ancient history. Um, and lastly, a different way to look at, uh, at this whole thing. So you probably heard about this thing called Ethereum, and, and some of you are probably developing Ethereum. Um, and uh, a little different way to look at meme coin. So meme coin is a distributed application. Basically, if we if we do a, um, an analogy to GitHub, blockchain is the master repository, and transactions are pull requests. Transactions are attempting to modify the blockchain or actually extend the blockchain while the users are the contributors because they are creating new transactions the ones who are approving them are miners but meme coin is also a distributed and single purpose computer the whole um, logic of this computer is money transfer so uh, what do i mean by distributing computer meaning all the nodes who are enforcing the protocol are actually running meme coin application so meme coin the computer is running the meme coin the application 
And this is similar to Bitcoin, which is a single purpose computer. But Ethereum is what happens when you say, I want to allow more than money transfers. I want to allow more than simple transactions. You get a general purpose computer. <laughs> or CryptoKitties. So let's review. Do we have a cool name and the logo? Yeah, I believe we do. Are we decentralized? Yes. Are transactions reversible? Nope. Currency and transactions, can they be forged? Nope. And we have a few bonus achievements. We managed to make transactions pseudo-anonymous. And we have a predictable currency issuance rate. So I got word that MemeCoin is the most successful uh, coin now. Uh, a few minutes after we launched, we managed to uh, take Bitcoin's market cap. So congratulations, guys. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do have uh, time for questions, so now let's yeah, have a Q&A. If you have any questions, I'm, I'll be happy to answer. Hi. Can you tell us a bit about the energy consumption of the transactions? Um, what do you mean by energy consumption? The computing you power? Know, yeah, no, the electricity that's consumed and uh, like the possible environmental impact of the whole system. Yeah, so the idea behind the energy consumption is actually logical. It makes sense because you want a mining to cost something that is ten, like it has a real world value. Okay, you want to tie it to something real. Now, it's not the most efficient solution, so that's why you have other solutions like proof of stake, which are currently somewhat experimental, but they don't require mining, they don't require proof of work, sorry. They rather, in, uh, you get a say in what happens, or you get a say in the mining uh, business according to the amount of coins you own. So, yeah, Bitcoin's uh, mining, for example, is very, very costly. It's uh, uh, taking a lot of power. Actually, I, I think I read it's like the power consumption of a uh, small country or something. I don't remember. Yeah, like it's, it's equivalent to the, the consumption of Bulgaria right now. And yeah, so uh, each transaction consumes about as much as uh, uh, almost 10 of U.S. households in a day. Yeah, that's because mining is a very uh, inefficient, I mean, the proof of work mining is very, um, it's a zero sum game. So if the coin costs the insane value it does now, people are very incentivized to mine and there is a lot of competition which results in a lot of power consumption. So the part of the problem is probably because of the ridiculous valuations, which uh, you can see they're ridiculous, it's not because I don't believe in Bitcoin, but it's because uh, of the huge transaction fees and uh, relatively uh, currently relatively poor use. So, uh, regarding your question, yeah, I think I think uh, the consumption is problematic, and I think uh, proof of stake will solve that hopefully. Hi there. Um, I don't quite understand. In MimCoin, let's say Bob has. Uh, a MacBook Pro and the others have Arduinos, why Bob can't win every single uh, proof of work challenge and the others get bored and, you know, Bob then retires and no one's processing these transactions anymore? Could yeah, that's a good question. Um, because the way mining works is there is an element of chance. So, um, it's like uh, flipping uh, a dice. So you can get your number on the first try and you can get your number on the sixth try or on the 50th try. As long as you get the number, you win. So if you have an Arduino, you have lower chance of winning, but you still have a chance.
Hello. I wanted to ask how the adjustment of the difficulty for computing the next block, um, how is this actually enforced? For example, I am Bob and I want to mine the next block. How do I know the, the difficulty of the next block and who, who dictates this difficulty or what's the consensus about the difficulty? Okay, uh, so the difficulty is actually self-adjusting, meaning it's part of the protocol. So you can take a look at of how many new blocks or pages you created uh, in the last, let's say, two weeks. And then you say it was too many pages or too few pages. And then you change the difficulty accordingly. You do it on your own as part of a, as a participant. So does everybody else. And if you, if you arrive to the wrong conclusion, you will be alone. Because you're supposed to be running the same client, the same protocol, basically. So uh, if the if the difficult if the protocol says you should have only 1,000 blocks every two weeks, just making this up, then you will adjust it accordingly every two weeks. Thanks for the talk. It was pretty nice. Um, what happens to transactions if you set the fee you, are, um, you want to pay too low? Do the transactions stay in limbo or what happens? You mean Bitcoin or? Yeah, Bitcoin especially, yes. Well, that's actually an implementation thing, but well, simply, simply speaking, as long as like, it depends on the mining uh, software basically. So you can write a mining software where you choose to insert low fee transactions. That's your choice. But uh, Bitcoin's mining software will always, I mean, it makes sense that we'll always choose the highest fees first. So if you put a fee that is very low and there is a lot of load on the network, you will, your transaction will take either a lot of time or will never enter the blockchain. Thanks. Um, so why do you have a Monero sticker on your laptop when you're talking about Bitcoin and MimeCoin? That's a good question. I didn't have time to print the stickers from MimeCoin. Uh, next time, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the great explanation. Um, what are your thoughts on non-public blockchains and technologies like uh, Hyperledger? Um, I'm not very familiar with Hyperledger. So, but if you mean non-public blockchains, like I know some companies are, cr are trying to create private blockchains, which is a bit ridiculous in my opinion, in my understanding of how this works, because why do you need it if you still need to trust the company? Then why bother with blockchain? I mean, the whole idea of this is that you don't need to trust anyone. So you just m take in a building a database, I guess, yeah, but why do it in blockchain? Why not build another database? Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. I wanted to ask, um, so in, in Europe we have the ECB and in the US you have the Fed and in different countries different central banks who basically dictate the monetary uh, rules, monetary policy, monetary supply, how fast and how slow to increase it or not. Um, and in your talk you said the miners decide the consensus. Which works fine if maybe like you have a whatever two percent inflation or whatever economists think is is healthy, but if you look at countries like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, then you have the same people just like dictating like now we just like print more and more money to I don't know pay police forces and military to keep us in power. Um, but if you said in your talk that minor dictate consensus, what does prevent? Um, the same system just repeating with even more electricity consumption. So my miners dictate consensus, they don't dictate the protocol. So if the protocol says every 10 minutes uh, 50 new meme coins should be created, then uh, all the network is enforcing this protocol, meaning people who are not miners, people who have relatively poor computing power, and they say if a miner decides to, to, to diverge from the protocol, the, uh, the participants simply say no, your uh, your tr your uh, page or your block or your transaction is invalid. Hello again. Um, you said you were a cryptocurrency enthusiast. If yeah. I want to become one, what are the interesting things to play around with? Uh, Bitcoin mining seems rather expensive. Should I run a copy of the uh, grab a copy of the ledger and validate stuff? 
what interesting currencies should I look at? Where's the fun stuff? Where's the exciting stuff? Thanks. Well, currently the exciting stuff is, if you ask me, at Ethereum, because uh, it has the largest uh, group of developers. So every every day you have a new thing happening in Ethereum. There are a lot of Ethereum killers out there who are uh, claiming to be the next Ethereum, and that that may be that may happen, but they have uh, almost nothing. Uh, on Ethereum in, in, in terms of, they, they may have a better technology, but they don't have uh, any uh, developers or, or applications or anything basically. So they have a long way to go. If you want to, to play around, I would suggest uh, learning Solidity and playing around with it. It's very fun. Hi, um, you said by linking the public key to an account, we gain this pseudo-anonymity. Um, what exactly is that and why is it not fully anonymous? So we, we don't link public key to an account, we actually say that uh, an account is a public key. A public key is an account. So it's pseudo-anonymous because I can see transfers between public key, but if I don't know who the public key belongs to, then I don't know who is the real guy behind it. So there is nothing preventing me from creating thousands of accounts, basically public and private key pairs, and uh, using each one for a different transaction. But if you know uh, my public key, then it's not anonymous anymore because you can track uh, my transactions. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, so I assume all cryptocurrencies are like inherently uh, scale bound, but what technologies can actually take this uh, scalability issue and maybe increase it by one order of magnitude, two orders of uh, magnitude, and really help uh, push the transaction rate? So there's, there's two things. Uh, there, is the, there are three, three things. There is the block size increase, which is uh, very limited and very controversial. There is the Lightning Network, which is very uh, promising, but has some, I mean, I don't want to sound negative, but, and I'm not negative, actually I'm very optimistic, but uh, I think uh, it has to prove itself yet because it has some questionable uh, characteristics. And then you have the Tangle, which is IOTA, which claims to be, not, which IOTA is like a cryptocurrency that is not based on a blockchain. So this whole talk doesn't, like, is re not relevant for IOTA. And IOTA used something called the, the Tangle, which is a proprietary, like, uh, directic acyclic graph uh, for, uh, in which basically the, the concept is, sounds almost magical, where you, um, you verify transactions, ba basically the tra the tra the, there is no real mining, simply it's when you want to make a transaction, you have to verify two other transactions. So basically if you spam the network, you're actually doing it a favor. So IOTA is like this magical thing, but since it's magical and almost like all things magical, it sounds a bit shady, there is no proven method, there is no proof behind it, and it's a proof of concept, and also nowadays, uh, there, it's, it's very centralized because they can't really use it as it should should be used. Instead, they use something called the coordinator, which is like a, basically a central bank. So they say they will remove the coordinator once uh, the, um, there are enough uh, users. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's yet to be seen. Uh, let's say after one day since you launched your mem memcoin, uh, a flaw is discovered in the uh, mining algorithm, and so how could you fix this? You, you s again, you said it's, uh, there is a flaw in the mining algorithm? Yeah, zero day or something that allows other people to do fast mining and stuff. So how could you update or just uh, cancel the whole system? Or Yeah, well, you do what's called the hard fork. So basically... You, hard fork is like uh, you change the rules, you change the protocol, and you say, okay, from now on, the old mining algorithm doesn't work anymore, so everybody needs to update at this minute to the new protocol. Uh, but uh, hard, por hard forks are very controversial because you actually enforce a new uh, protocol on, on all the users. So uh, hard fork can solve this, and uh, hard forks have, been, have happened in Ethereum and in Bitcoin. Well, actually, in Bitcoin, only uh, 
I think only in the early days. But in Ethereum, they happen. They happened when uh, the DAO hack to restore the stolen funds. <coughs> Hello. Thank you for your talk. Uh, first, be very careful with IOTA. It gets a lot of hype for a very kind of unproven and uh, shady system. Second, I have a question. Um, right now, there's a lot of concentration going on of the mining power. So I think kind of around 50% of the mining power are concentrated in like four Chinese uh, big mining conglomerates. Do you think there's a danger there? And if so, is there a way to kind of counteract this? Yeah, there is definitely a danger there, though... It depends on your definition of danger. Like, if you think Bitcoin will uh, collapse because of it, yeah, I think it depends on what you, what you mean by Bitcoin. Like, uh, because today when you say Bitcoin, some people think of Bitcoin Cash. Uh, so they, they claim they're the real Bitcoin. And everybody's forking Bitcoin now to, to either make a quick profit or claim they, they have a better solution. So mining power concentration is a big issue because... Um, they can be uh, like one day dictate that they control the currency but essentially when when they do that the currency will lose all of its value in a second and then the problem is solved right just there is no they control now thin air so they are not very incentivized to they have the incentive to remain honest and play along uh, i don't know how it will work out if there is someone who has nothing to lose and doesn't care about it then he can attack the network but I would imagine the most harm you can do is just um, enforce a fork in which they change the mining, mining algorithm basically um, could you tell something about the downsides of blockchain because everybody says oh it's it's a magical thing and uh, we, we must use it and it's so nice. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit of the downsides that this brings with it? Yeah, it's very it's very uh, inefficient. You mean, you know, the whole scaling issue. It's there for a reason. I mean, you can't really scale on chain. If you if you want to scale, then you need to increase the block size. The block size is basically how many transactions are allowed to be included in each block. If each block is in 10 minutes and you can only include a thousand transactions in each block, that means that's your throughput. So uh, if you want to scale, you need to increase that block. And then when you, when you increase the block, uh, the blockchain gets huge. And then you have this huge file, which, w which like the uh, size of a couple of terabytes or more, which is what Bitcoin is trying to avoid. That's why it's not increasing the block size. And then you are actually uh, causing more centralization because you and I can't uh, run a node anymore because uh, the block is uh, uh, the blockchain is too big for our computer, so we have to buy a, a good computer to support that. And then, so this is when talking about Bitcoin, but blockchain, it's it's not magical at all. Like it, it's very, it's very powerful technology, and if you use correctly, it can. Literally, when I say change the world, I mean, it can, like Ethereum is very, very, like, um, when people think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is one thing. But if you now look at Ethereum, it, it created this whole new ecosystem. But it's very limited in some ways. So private blockchains are probably bullshit. And blockchain for, like, every possible solution is also probably bullshit. Like, wh when you look today at the coins that are available, I mean, why do they exist? They, okay, they, they, most of the coins claim to be some kind of a currency, uh, but why do you need it if you have a currency, already a, a, a five or 10 currencies that work on a blockchain? So I think definitely it's overused. It's the new cyber or the new uh, IoT or the new cloud. But at the same time, it is really an amazing technology. Yeah, so thanks for sharing your knowledge. Um, as we saw in my MimCoin, um, the value of the MimCoin himself is increasing pretty fast. Um, the result out of that is that nobody is spending the, the coin as a real currency or using it as a real currency. Um, how can we motivate them to use it as a currency at the end? Yeah, so if you ask me, uh, yeah, that's um, Bitcoin is, is very bad money. 
very very bad. It's not. It's a store of. It's a. It's an extremely good store of value, but it's a very very bad money because it's. It you have no incentive to use it, essentially. So you have a, a few solutions. First, you can introduce inflation. If it's a controlled inflation, then it's probably a good thing because inflation is there for a reason. If it's a controlled inflation, though, if it's not, if you can't decide one day to you know, and then. Um, um, I mean, yeah, probably Bitcoin, as you know it now, in my opinion, won't be the currency of choice. So, I don't have any more ideas of what, what can be done. Hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a small question. What is Secure Witness? I heard something about that, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so SegWit is like, uh, it's a, it's a, basically, meme coin is very, very, very simple, and it has a lot of abstraction. In Bitcoin, what actually happens is that transactions are uh, scripts written in a special language, and um, the thing called witness script, which is the actually the, I want to sound, I th it's not the digital signature, but it's like the, it's the unlocking, it's the locking or unlocking script, I don't remember which one, the, the script that uh, allows you to spend the money uh, that you received. Um, they removed it from the, from the blockchain itself. So from the transaction, so, um, the block is one megabyte, right? So you can fit only uh, X amount of transactions. The reason is because each transaction takes space. So the uh, SegWit essentially reduces the space that the transaction takes by removing the witness script out of the transaction in a clever way. So this is the, uh, I think we should stay at this high level because otherwise uh, it will get complex. Some more questions? Is that, is that a question? <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.